you know, the show covers a lot of tough issues and tough events and a lot of sorrow and uh, things that need to change uh, with our government and people's lives relating to family law and the judiciary. Uh, but today we're going to have a special announcement somewhere in the show of uh, some recent victories uh, where people had to go through extenuating situations in, in order to win and to preserve their constitutional and family rights. Uh, so it, you're, you're going to have an exciting show uh, tonight. Uh, but um, before we get into that, we're going to have a prelude to that. I had uh, a guest on a couple, about a month ago or so, uh, Dwight Mitchell, and you know he's backed by popular demand. A lot of uh, strong and, and positive reaction uh, to the show that we put together, and of course, popular demand is is me right here. I'm I'm demanding this, <laughs> so I get to do that. You know, you could have your own cable show too. Uh, it's very easy. Just come down to SPNN where we're shooting live from tonight and find out how it works. And you could be doing this too. Uh, it's people want to know what's going on. If you got information, you can call me. Uh, speechless, well, speechlessmn at gmail.com. That's an email. Try to call me there. Good luck. Uh, and you can watch some past shows, youtube.com forward slash speechlessmn. Uh, phone number to call in here if you've got comments or questions, but because the way the system is, it's kind of questionable whether we'll get to you or not. Uh, so, um, okay, Dwight Mitchell. We're going to get right into it today. Thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Sir. And since we last met, I don't believe you started your foundation yet. Uh, maybe you did, but I forget. But so, why don't you tell me a little bit about your foundation? We talked a lot about uh, stop uh, CPS from kidnapping children. Correct. Right in the last show. So now you have a foundation going. It's a 501c3. Why don't you tell us about that and Okay. Well, well, the foundation is actually, it, it's, it was formed uh, at, at our last show. Most people know of us as Stop CPS. It's one of our programs. It's one of the things we're trying to do as a foundation. Um, one of the new programs that we recently started uh, about two or three months ago was, was our legal aid clinic. So, uh, oh, okay. And so that, uh, that led to our very first case, you know, which just completed two weeks ago, and we'll, we'll speak to that later on. So, the Stop CPS is our advocacy. This is our, our uh, parental rights group. This is our association that has exploded uh, beyond you know, comprehension of what, what I thought would have happened. I mean, I put together a, a victim's rights group, so to speak, uh -huh. uh, trying to understand you know, how people are dealing with CPS and, and, and what's going on as it relates to child protection services in Minnesota. Um, during the first month, we had about 250 members, and, and that that was okay. Uh, I could handle that. I was, t I was talking to people, and we were, you know, trying to come to grips with, with child protection services and what we felt were unconstitutional stat standards, just overreaching of taking people's children um, with no showing of harm, uh, we were having difficulty with. Uh, within the last 120 days, we have went from 250 people to over 4,400 members. Wow. So uh, looking at the Facebook graphs and the charts, we've had like a 453% increase month over month, and uh, 50 people are, are, are joining a day. And um, I think yesterday when I, when I looked online, um, I have two moderators, but I know when I looked online yesterday, there were 50 people waiting in the queue just to be approved to the group. So, okay. You know, so we have a fan page. Uh, which has all of our video, and then we have the group page where everyone is helping each other. We put tips out and guidelines and things of that nature. So that's that's part of the foundation, and that's that's what I started initially. This parent association. Um, well, and I want to say from our last show that's on YouTube on Speechless, uh, MN. Uh, I've, I've gotten a number of comments, and people have contacted me through the email and said, "Hey." You know, I'm in Illinois, I'm in Florida, I'm, you know, all these other parts of the state and of the nation, and I'm having this problem. I'm a good parent, and they came and got my kids, right. you know. So 
the, the show has had uh, a national reach. We know the show has an international reach too, but uh, because it's on it's on the internet, so right. anybody could watch it, That's and right. uh, they're they're watching this. So uh, people want your type of organization because they're desperate. Well, it's it's interesting when you know we're. You know, I'm in IT, so we're a data-driven organization. I'm looking at like reports and statistics, and I'm like, what is the government reporting, and what you know, what are they doing? And so, uh, a natural progression was to say, well, here's, you know, what's going on in Minnesota. Well, how do we stack up against the rest of the, you know, the states in the union? And so, when I did this analysis, I found that there were over 453,000 children that are removed annually uh, out of homes in the United States, and that we spend approximately $29.1 billion annually on, on child care, child welfare. 450,000 annually? Annually, annually. That's staggering. It, it was, I was, I was amazed. I, I, I said, and no one's talking about this, so this is one of these Well, you, but you know what secrets. they are talking about, about the illegal immigrants that are having their children taken away. Right. As well, they should. That should be a discussion because it is an abuse to separate children from parents. It's traumatizing. There, there's traumatizing trauma going on there, right. so it should be discussed, and yet what's ignored is the hundreds of thousands of times more is happening to our own families here in the United States. Well, something I found ironic was that Emily Piper, who's the commissioner of Minnesota, actually put out a, like a press release, and, and so it was in the news, and she was talking about how horrible it was to separate children from their families. And all I could think of was the hypocrisy. I'm like, last year you took 15,004 children out of their homes in Minnesota. The staggering part was that the majority of the children that were taken out weren't for physical abuse or sexual abuse. That percentage was like 12% for physical and 4%. And that's by social workers' uh, determination. They say, well, okay, well, what is this person taken for? Oh, that one's physical, that's a spanking. And, and, and that's sexual, that's touching. But these statistics are all done before trial. So none of the statistics that are reported are post-trial statistics. They're like, as we come in intake, that's what they're reporting. Wait a second. So they're taking kids without any, really, any form of due process. No. Uh, they're gone. There's that's no correct. warrant. That's correct. There's no um, probable cause. That's correct. There could be, but... But, they, but in the majority of them, they're not. Well, we'll take our neighbor, for instance, in, in, in Wisconsin. Um, in order for them to room a child, there is a system in place where they have to uh, present the information before an advisory board. And so you, you, have to, um, you, you have to present evidence and you have to have enough to say, okay, now let's go to the judge and ask for a warrant. So it, it has to be corroborated. You just can't, a person just can't call and say, this is what I saw. You have to have evidence. Well, Minnesota doesn't have that. Minnesota allows them to take children purely on allegations. So it's a prima facie case. And what they say is, well, if these allegations are true, well, this is a CHIPS trial, a child. And I'm like, well, why doesn't the social worker present evidence right up front right. to the judge before the child is removed? No, the allegations will hold all the way up to the trial. So the, the, the whole standard in Minnesota is skewed. You're like, you're, and this is why we're saying it's, it's legal kidnapping. You are taking a child out of a household purely based on allegations that the social worker isn't required to prove till trial, and a trial isn't required to 60 to 93 days. In our first case, the child was out of home for 120 days just to be found innocent. Wow. And, and so... We went to court time and time again, and we'll speak to that later, but I'm, you know, I want to, you know, elaborate on this process that, that's happening in Minnesota and how children are being illegally kidnapped and Well, why we say that. So this one, say 120 days, but there's, there's no guarantee that you'll get in that soon. No, no. And I, I mean, so it, it could be a long time, and it may be never, you, have, you never have the trial at all. Well, what's fascinating is that when I looked at the government statistics, Minnesota, Minnesota reports its annual out-of-home placement statistics annually. So in October of 2017, um, I, I was going through the statistics, 
and I was looking at the average time that a child was out of home. And so the, the you know, 68% of the children that they removed were out of the home for, for three months or longer, three to six months. Wow. And then 59%, if I remember correctly, it was in the 50s, were out of the home for six months or longer. Wow. And so you look at this process and I said, okay, uh, you know, based upon the Freedom of Information Act, I actually sent a request two weeks ago to say, you know, from the numbers that you presented, this 15,004 people, how many were actually found guilty at trial? Mm -hmm. And so I haven't received it yet. I'm, okay. I'm giving them two weeks. I'm like, this is a computer. It, you know, it's not, it doesn't take two weeks to, to answer an email. So I sent a letter. And so I'm waiting to respond. And I want to know what the actual figures are. So there's this. Um, well, and then how many get to trial because of the pressure that's put on the parent? You go do this, this, and this, and you'll get your child back. And but if you mess up, you know, just the pressure, you, you agree that you did something and then you have a chance of getting your child back or you'll never get them back. Right. They dangle your child over your head like a carrot. And so in, in my particular case, I was fighting them, you know, very, from the very beginning. And I said, I want my discovery. I'm not guilty. And so then my attorney said, you know, you have to cooperate. You have to work. with." I says, no, I don't. I said, this is an adversary relationship. I said, that's, that's our government. That's our, our legal system. Mm -hmm. I said, you have you know, the prosecutor and mm -hmm. you have the defense. I said, you don't go and say, OK, you know, Mr. Defendant, give me everything to convict you. I'm like, that's not an adversarial right. court system. Right. And so what's happening now is, and, and I don't know how our, uh, our CPS and family court system got so corrupted, but what's actually happening now is they're saying, Okay, you you cooperate with us, you plead guilty, or you say you need services, and then we'll work with you to get you your son back. And I'm like, no, that's not the way it works. Right. You need to prove that this parent is guilty of some sort of abuse or neglect, then you get to do your services. Well, that's not how it works. And so th they get the parents who agree by, by dangling this carrot, saying, we'll give you your kid back. And so the parents are like doing whatever they you know, social workers say to get their kids back. And the social workers just dragging it out and dragging it out. And so I'm trying to get statistics. And I think when I, if I, if I get them, and I'm going to write again, I think it's going to be alarming and explosive. Yeah. We're going to find out that, that these are not going to trial. I, I think you're going to, whatever the information, I think it will be explosive one way or the other, just because of the way the system's set up. It right. has to be. So, but you had mentioned you have legal aid clinics? Yes, yes. So, so how often do they meet? Where do they meet? Or well, how do you work that? We're, we're in downtown Minneapolis. We're in, we're in uh, Union Plaza downtown, and we're, trying to, we're actually trying to grow that. Um, we've taken on our first case. We've actually started a, a fundraiser to actually hire more attorneys. We feel that um, the attorneys in Minnesota now are, are currently overwhelmed. If they're getting 15,000 cases a year, well, there aren't enough attorneys to go around. And most of the most of the parents are going unrepresented. And so right. that's, that's part of the problem also. They don't know their rights. They're, they aren't aware yes, that right. they're being taken advantage of by the state system, by the county attorney, by the social workers. And, you know, no one is, is advocating for them. So that's what we're doing. We're, we're putting out pamphlets, flyers, and we've taken on our first case. And so we've started this fundraiser, and we've put the figures out on the site, and we're saying, okay, well, each attorney costs $70,000. So we're trying to, to get enough to you know, uh, enough donations to hire another attorney. And so for every 70,000 we can get, we can actually hire another full-time staff attorney. Full-time staff. Full-time full okay. staff. So we, right. don't, we don't want to do pro bono. This is all we want to do. And we're sitting here estimating that even with, we said, okay, even if we have seven full-time attorneys, we can probably only do about, you know, somewhere between 150 and 200 cases a year. Oh, that would be unbelievable. Well, that, it's that a would, drop in the bucket, though. It's a drop in know, the bucket, but... But it's better than nothing. But messages get sent. Right. I mean, we'll talk about this case today later on, but a message was sent. Yes. And now there's going to be feedback from the message that was sent. And I, I But so. you, you have one, but then when you get more, a bigger message gets sent, Correct. and then people start, okay... Here's not only is there a problem, here's the problem. Right. Here's what needs to be addressed. And we, we, we really don't think that that's going to happen 
uh, and, until we have maybe five to ten like successes in a row. And I look at the way the statutes right. are set up, and I'm agree. like, well, well, we can't ha you know, help but have successes because I'm like, well, you're pulling out the child without any harm. So when we go to trial, you're going to have to, you know, just like with this case, show that there was harm. Well, there was no harm, so they had to let the child go. But you traumatize this child and his mm -hmm. family for 120 days. Right. That's the issue that we're fighting against. This, okay. You know, you could have kept that child at home. You could have continued your process, you know, and went to trial and say, okay, we won. Now we'll take your child. But to rip the child away on the very first day, you know, that's, that's you know, an issue. There's got to be a higher, there has to be a lot higher standard than what they're using. Right. Uh, so in, in light of all that, what, what's kind of your mission statement? I mean, you kind of described it generally, but more specifically, what would your mission statement be? It, our, our mission statement is the preservation of the family unit. We, we uh, feel that it should be much, much harder for families to be terminated. Not that there isn't a need for social services. Um, we feel that there is a need for social services, but not in its present form. We, we feel the current system needs to be abolished and it needs to be re-engineered and it needs to be constitutional. Uh, the way that it's currently organized, um, we, we feel it is not being effective and they're not actually helping families. We, we, we feel they're doing more damage. So we're, we're doing advocacy, you know, on the legislation side. You know, we, we're not really lobbying. We're just saying we're, we're going to the, you know, the task force meetings and making our recommendations and things of that nature. We're trying to hire attorneys, paralegals, and then we're trying to open offices all throughout Minnesota. So from, uh, from a Minneapolis base, we're gonna try and expand. We've actually set up meetings to talk to all the tribal councils right now. Oh, so we're, we're nice. looking to open up uh, a branch at each tribe because of the amount of uh, Native Americans being taken. Uh -huh. um, um, so we're, we're trying to move forward. And that's, that's our key mission, it's the preservation of the family. And we, we really strongly believe in family first. Okay. Uh, well. I want to just kind of go back and want you to give me about two minutes of your own personal story. We did we discussed that on our last show, so you can go and go to YouTube, uh, Speechless MN, and watch the last show we did and hear Dwight's story. And we ran out of time to talk about your organization, so uh, we're doing that here. But so just briefly, two minutes on your story because it's pretty foundational to why. Your foundation started. It, it, it is. I, you know, I became involved in, in child protection services over what I thought was ordinary corporal punishment. It, it's something that um, all, all parents did growing up. I mean, most boys I know got a spanking on the behind. You know, it, it's it's you know, temporary pain. You know, it's transient. Uh, um, did it bother us? But did it bother us to get a spanking? No, no we, we, no. you know, we grew up fine. I have my own company. I mean, <laughs> I, I, you know, went to college. Uh, I think our society was much better then. Mm -hmm. I mean, we, we weren't having the Columbine and the mass shootings and all of the things. We've taken discipline completely out of our society. So this 30-year-old social experiment that we did uh, is, has not been positive to me. It's actually been detrimental. Mm -hmm. But so by me exercising my parental right, which Minnesota, as a matter of fact, says you can do. It says you are allowed to use corporal punishment in Minnesota. They even allow the schools to use it, private schools. Yes. You know, so right. it is legal, but the minute you do it, they say, oh, it's illegal at the same time. And you're like, well, wait a minute, you can't have two standards. So, you know, it's under-inclusive. It's mm -hmm. either illegal or it's not illegal. But So it took me 22 months to get my family completely reunited. Now, this was with uh, the... The, their psychologists, you know, multiple psychologists, so everyone was saying, give this man back his children. Mm -hmm. um, and this went on for 22 months, and then finally I got my say in court. It took me 22 months to get my say in court. And once I presented the judge all of my evidence, the very next case, the judge was like, well, I, you know, I've been very well briefed, Mr. Mitchell. He says, I, I have to deliberate on this. You know, give me 30 days and, and come back, and we'll see what's going on. We got back into court in 30 days, the, the county attorney says, before we even start, Your Honor, we'd like to withdraw our motion for uh, termination of parental rights. We want to drop our charges, Mr. Mitchell. <laughs> and we, we requested the court dismiss them, and we have his son in court with him today. You know, so they, they, they had my son waiting for me in court that day 
because they didn't want the judge to rule in my favor. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there's no other reason. You kept him for 22 months, and you had actually started a termination of my parental rights. And then the minute I finally got my say in court, you said, all right, here, here's your son. We're going we're gonna to stop. That's outrageous, you know. It, to me, with my experiences in the court, is watching these, I think the judge had some conversation with the county attorney. That's Probably. just my opinion. Don't know. Some, but, something happened to make them do an about face in less and, than And why days. would the judge be so, oh, okay, about it? Was he pretty nonchalant or she nonchalant? Yeah, she she just accepted said, it right away, and I said, well, Your Honor, you still have to rule on my three motions. I said, I have a, a motion to vacate. You know, and I said, you, you usurp subject matter jurisdiction. You knew about it. I said, I need you to rule on these things. Oh, well, it's moot now. I said, it's not moot. I said, you know, these motions are still in effect. And so uh -huh. they were never ruled upon, and, and, and I'm still trying to figure out what to do in that regard. But, okay. you know. Well, but you, you have filed a lawsuit. I have a filed federal a lawsuit. lawsuit. Correct. And that it started out on your behalf. Correct. Okay, and that, where is it now? Well, what I, what I ended up doing is And that, what was the lawsuit about? The, the lawsuit is, uh, was about you know, how I was affected, but it wasn't just how I was affected. I, I, you know, when I was talking to my lawyer, uh, Eric Cardell, I said, this shouldn't happen to anyone. I said, what I went through was a nightmare, and I said, these laws are, are, are unconstitutional, and at the time I was calling them illegal, and he says, well, they're really not illegal. <laughs> he said, uh -huh. they're unconstitutional. I said, well, then, you know, how do we affect this? You know, how do we do a change? Mm -hmm. and, you know, and, and so that became my mission statement is, you know, how to help other people. And a lot of people say, well, why are you doing this? You've had your kids back for like two and three years. They said, you know, why are you fighting and advocating for everyone else? I said, I said, I was permanently damaged. My family was permanently damaged. And I don't think this should happen to anyone in America. And I said, I'm fighting to get these laws changed. They're unconstitutional. And I'm fighting for all 400 of 4,400 members of my association right now, because if we win, then, you know, everyone will be affected, and it's, it, 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 it'll have far-reaching effects. Right. So, um, what, is there another court date coming up? Yes, Recently. As, as a matter of fact, we have our first hearing, you know, when you file your petition, we filed it in, in April, and it's all this back and forth, and, right. and, you know, and so our first court date Which is... Which the government has a right to defend themselves. They do. They're, there's this motion here, and you know, we're motion to dismiss, we're like, you know, opposition to the motion, you know, summary judgment, you know, it's, and I'm sitting here looking at all these papers going back, and I'm like, when do we get in court? Yeah. So we have our first court date, uh, October 9th. October, okay. And so um, I'm, you know, going to tell everyone in the association to come down to the courtroom, and I'm like, let's come hear what the, what the judge has to say. And, you know, uh, the state and the county are asking for the judge to dismiss the case. So we're, this is a motion to dismiss by the state and county's by, part? By, by the state. Okay. And we're like, there's no way in God's green earth this is going to be dismissed. We submitted 84 pages of official documented evidence by the social workers because I had my discovery that shows that they fabricated, you know, evidence and you were, were holding exculpatory information. We're like, you know, that they even asked, well, it's, you know, they got to do their due diligence. They have to ask, mm -hmm. but we feel, you know, there's no way the judge is going to dismiss it. And if she does, we're going to be like, okay, you know, let's, let's hear your opinion on this one. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, really? Well, uh, I'd love to film that, but the federal government doesn't allow filming in courts. I thought they uh, did. No. Oh, okay, in Minnesota. <laughs> Not in Minnesota. Some of them do, okay. and it's a test pilot that's been going on for 20 years or something I know like the Ninth that. Circuit did, so the Ninth Circuit okay. allows recording. I don't yeah. know who, but... Okay. No, they, they don't do that here. Uh, and do you know what judge you're going to be before? Judge Wright. Judge Wright. Ju judge Wilhelmina Wright. Oh, Wilhelmina Wright, former yes. U.S. Supreme... Uh, Minnesota yes. Supreme Court yes. Justice. Mm -hmm. Right. So she's very familiar, with, that's interesting, because she's very familiar with family law and the court cases that have gone uh, through her. Uh, that's going to put her in a big, in my opinion, in a big, tight spot. Well, no, because, it, I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we've, we've submitted Eighth Circuit, you know, case law, you know, that, that's precedential, that's, that talks about the removal of child. This isn't a new topic. So, no, not at all. You know, what... You know, what she has to apply is, is presidential case law, and as it relates to immunities, uh, you know, all of this has been decided. So she has, you know, a, a wealth of information to, to draw upon. 
uh, you know, I, I can't speak for the judge. We're only looking at it from our side, and we're saying, uh, here's the case law, here's the case law, here's the case law, you know, here's what you have to follow, Your Honor, and we're, we're sitting here saying, okay, if she follows the case law, we're, we're moving forward. So we're, you know, I'm not, I'm not even, I'm not trying to be cocky or, or confident in that, because we have a long process. Right, you should, you know, you this, should do This it. is just the first, but the motion to dismiss, we're, we're fairly confident that that's not going to yeah. take place. Wow, you know? and, and, and in my mind, that would be huge. To me, and what I know, this is earth shattering hmm. in, in, in the family. Even though there's a lot of precedents on this, the, the, how many times people go and try to apply the law mm -hmm. in their cases or other people's cases or group cases, it just doesn't happen that much. Right. Because one, it's costly, it's expensive, you gotta have attorneys knowing what to do, how to do it, and uh, somebody, the, the individual themselves needs to know what to do, you know? Well, you gotta remember, the first, so. our first six claims are facial claims, meaning we're saying these statutes on their face are unconstitutional, and okay. we're bringing associational claims. So it's, it's my association, just like the NAACP or the right. ACLU, it's an association, we're 501c3, and we're, we're saying, Your Honor, these, these claims are unconstitutional, and it and affects all of the citizens of Minnesota. So it's not just Dwight, it's not, you know, it's, it's everyone. Mm -hmm. So those are, you, you can't dismiss facial claims, you know. It's, right. Uh, and when I say you can't, an association has standing to bring facial claims right. to say, for the state. You're not going to lose state. a jurisdictional issue. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. So. Nice. So, so what, what are some of your uh, long-term goals? immediate long-term goals for the foundation? Well, we're, you know, we're, we're trying to set up a model uh, in, in Minnesota uh, that can be replicated. So our, our immediate goal, as I said, is, is our expansion. So we, we set up a Facebook fundraiser to try and raise funds for an attorney. So if you go to our, our Facebook fan page, you'll see the donate there. And we, you know, we have a goal. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a modest goal. When we say uh, modest, it's uh, 500000 but when you look at attorneys and you say, okay, an attorney's salary is $70,000, a paralegal is 50000 you know, and, a, and a, a, an attendant to vet is like 45000 So we're saying, well, we're trying to get, you know, two or three attorneys, a paralegal, and um, um, a receptionist that can call and vet. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're sitting here saying, you know, from a two-year perspective, you know, that's about a half a million dollars. But if you really think about it, that's really not a lot. So right. you know, we're trying to raise the race and do right. that. And if we can set up this pilot, as I said, we're, we're going to, uh, we actually are on the agenda uh, to meet with the tribes to try and get an office in each one of those. And then from there, we hope to replicate this across the nation. So that's our long-term goal. Mm -hmm. So we, if we can set up this pilot and, you know, we win some of the cases and, you know, they are deemed unconstitutional, then we're going to go to the next state and we're going to say, okay, Let's let's replicate this. We'll we'll start a, a fundraiser and we'll say, okay, we're trying to raise seventy thousand dollars for an attorney for this office, you know. And then this the the attorney's sole function is going to be to fight CPS cases, nothing else. That's our sole focus mm -hmm. is to is to help families and and it's low income families because these are the ones who can't afford attorneys and they're the ones who are being uh, adversely affected because they're they're terrified. They don't know what to do. They don't have an attorney and they're being. Um, uh, coerced into uh, signing agreements, cooperate with us. If you don't cooperate, you'll never see your child again. And that's that's not the law. That's that's not what it says. There is nowhere in the uh, law where it says you have to cooperate with CPS and you have to do what they right. say to get your child back. It's like no, we have to have a trial first. You have right. to prove that I am unfit, and then. I can do services. Well, you have rights, and it's like the government tries to use those rights against you. Oh, you're going you're gonna to use your right to have an attorney? Well, we're going to punish you for that. That is correct. We're going to make you go through a lot more hoops. That's correct. You know, and our, it was kind of interesting. We had one legal counsel on, on the case that we, that we just won, and we ended up having three at trial, meaning the state was fighting tooth and nail, and we're like, we don't understand. You've had the evidence since the very beginning. Nothing has changed. We didn't present any new evidence at trial. Right. No new evidence. The state called all of these witnesses, and at the end, it was like, child's not medically neglected. 
And we're sitting here saying, you had this on day one. And the state's, state's witnesses testified against the state. Yep. <laughs> Exactly. Ah, so ah. they paid all of this money. I'm going to tell you how much it cost them. You know, yeah. and this is going to be funny. I, I, uh, the reason I know this is because you know, they were trying to get, get us to split some of the cost, and we were like, oh, no, we're not going to do that. And when I say we, uh, when we were talking to the doctors, uh, the lawyer for the doctor said, well, this is what it's going to cost. And it said it's going to cost $4,000 for the doctor to show up and $1,000 every half hour. And I said, and you had multiple doctors and nurses uh, on just the one doctor, I, I'm sure it was $10,000 for the one, and then another was another $10,000. And I don't have the exact figures, mm -hmm. but I know all the witnesses. They they spent $100,000 easily. Uh, you know, you know, witnesses, lawyers, three-day trial, and we're like, all because the child is innocent. They didn't want to lose. And it you didn't know. bother them a bit. Didn't, and nope. uh, you know, I've on my show, I've had people on the show, and uh, that. Try the government has no problem spending money to make sure fit people don't have their kids. You're right. They You're right. spend a lot of money, and and it goes in all directions, whether it's relatives or foster care or good foster care people. Uh, the state has a specific purpose for people. Mm -hmm. I actually talked with somebody who had the same caseworkers for your case. Really? And they were working against them and. They describe these caseworkers, this particular group of people, same people you had, wow. as a cell, as a cell that has a specific job to do, and that job is to remove that child or make sure uh, the government's plans are done and not what's really in the best interest of the child, which they're looking at what's in the best interest of the state here. So <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to agree with you. I mean, I, I have my own opinion. People have asked me, and they say, well, what, what, what do you think of child protection? And, you know, every, everyone can't be bad. I mean, I mean, there has to be some good social workers. And uh, this trial has changed my opinion. Uh, you know, I've done other interviews where I said, yes, there, there has to be good social workers. But after this trial, my opinion has completely changed. I said, you're all guilty by association. You all know what's going on, and you all know what you're doing. In this particular case, uh, we sent the information. So it started on the very first day that Amanda's son was taken. And so we sent all of the information to the social worker, uh, Katie Canetto, who, who took the, the child. And we're saying, this isn't correct. Here's the doctor's reports. You ordered the doctor's reports. The doctor said the child was fine. You knew the very next day the, doctor was, the child was fine because you ordered the reports. We sent it to her director. Brad Vold, the director mm -hmm. of uh, Morrison County Social Services, who disregarded. I sent it to Jim Koppel, the mm -hmm. assistant director. We sent it to the, the commissioner. Mm -hmm. So we kept going up the chain of command, sending every like somebody has to look at this. This is like this can't be happening. We thought this should have been over in like in a couple of days, and it was like month after month. Uh, you know, working with us, Amanda ended up filing a, a, a formal complaint against Katie Canetto, who was a social worker. And now the board of social workers said we presented enough evidence that they've opened a formal investigation against that social worker. And so we just need to get the transcripts and present that to the board of social workers. We sent them the judge's order and the uh, judge's findings that there was uh, misinformation intentionally uh, supplied and uh, that uh, Katie Canelo was directly involved. Okay. But the judge did an opinion on that. And that surprised us all. Like, you know, Judge Weller. Uh, Judge Leonard Weller, Leonard Weller, uh, okay, said that um, I'm not. I said this, this information was presented. He says I'm not going to opinion on on Dr. Voida, Cassandra Voida. I'm sorry, not Doctor Nurse Voida, who supplied the misinformation, and or Katie Canetto, the social worker. He says I'm not going to. You know, I'm not going to render my opinion. I'm like, well, Your Honor, you just heard three days of trial. You have an opinion. You said it was misinformation and it was used to, right. to withhold a child. Why aren't you giving your opinion on it? And I saw that in that in, in, the, in the order. Right. It said misinformation, he, he, disinformation. It just was right there. Right. But he said, I'm not, I'm not going to opinion on it. He said, it's the only thing I'm here. But I'm you were asking on. for one. Yes, we were. We wanted to, we wanted to know. And so, well, and, and this is what happens. I mean, you, you raise constant 
a person raises constitutional issues, they ask questions, we need this resolved, is this a problem, whatever, and then a judge just says, no, nah, I won't. That's correct. We, we raised our constitutional issues. We filed a formal motion uh, raising the, the constitutional aspects, and he just said, denied. You know, we did a motion to dismiss. He says, denied. That's it. And no, no reasons, no anything. Just denied. You know, well, he gives a reason. He gives his opinion, and everything led back to the prima facie. He's like, well, a prima facie case has been stated. Well, and if it's true, well, this is a chip's child. We're like, but Your Honor, they, you know, they've presented no evidence. He's like, they don't have to. That's, that's our law. And so we had to wait to go to trial for yeah. this. Yeah. So. so I don't know when you want to bring Amanda on. we got about uh, 20 minutes left. You, you, so could, you can bring her out. Are there now. some other issues you want to talk about first? Or? No, I, I, we'll probably cover some of them with, uh, with, with Amanda also. I mean, you know, we're going to talk about uh, the case in detail, and we'll okay. let her, you know, give you her opinion, and we're going to bring on her son, Zavion. Yeah. You know, that's a surprise that we got him back. You know, we rescued. You know, now that's we're so up exciting. to 12 children now. So we've, we've rescued 12 children. 12. So that's, that's a success. You know, we've, you know, either uh, got the cases dismissed uh -huh. or, like in Amanda's case, went to trial and won. Yeah. So. Um, well, I, I just wanted, you, I saw the Star Tribune article mm -hmm. that came out. You had your press conference yesterday. Yes. And I saw the Star Tribune article. And it's like the second response of that article was somebody who was inside the system and said, yeah, this is bad, but that's the way it is. Right. And it's worse than that. That's correct. You know, well, I don't, we don't know who they are or anything like that, but uh, uh, really who they are, but that's what they were saying. True, true. But I don't doubt them because I know better. <laughs> but, <laughs> I, I do so. now also after four years and, you know, two years of fighting and you know, two years to get my kids back and then two more years now. And then, you know, helping the, the parents and then, you know, helping Amanda get Savian back and protecting our other two children so that they wouldn't get taken. It's easier to take children. If one child is designated CHIPS, the other children in the household are automatically designated CHIPS also. So they don't just take one, they come and take all three. So we save all three of Amanda's children from being taken. Right, but I've yeah. seen it a lot of times where they'll just take one They'll just take one child and leave the parent with the others, that, which is bizarre in of itself. If they're dangerous for one, why aren't they dangerous for the others? You need to get your microphone on there. So, uh, so it's, it's baffling, and there seems to be no rhyme or reason in, reasoning to it. It, it does not. What, what was bizarre, even in my case, is that... Uh, they gave me back my six-year-old in five months. So they, you know, they, oh, they, yeah, they, they take all the children right. and they say, okay, your house is safe. Here's your six-year-old. But we're not giving you back a 10-year-old. I'm like, well, if my house is safe for a six-year-old, <laughs> I think it's safe for a 10-year-old. So you give me back the six-year-old. You say the 15-year-old is, is no longer under your, your services, but we're keeping the 10-year-old. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm like, but why? Because we can Mm -hmm. That basically is what they were saying. Mm -hmm. They were like, we're sending them to his mother. And I'm like, you, you don't have the right to do that. I said, I have a, a, a court order. They said, we can do whatever we want to do. They literally told me that. They're like, you're not in New Jersey, you're in Minnesota now. We can do whatever we want to do in Minnesota. Wow. And I, wow. so that's part of the yeah, issue. They, I, they can't. And, uh, but they do. They do. Until you stop them, and good luck stopping them. And fortunately, you were able to. Yes. yes. But it... Uh, it took somebody with a lot of knowledge and fortitude and being able to dig in there, because I know attorneys that haven't figured this out. Well, the attorneys you know. are, you know, uh, are used to, uh, they're used to losing, and they're not, they don't fight. The attorneys actually come in with this, you know, cooperate and compromise, and we'll, you know, we'll negotiate and try and get your child back. I'm like, no, 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 no. You go in there, you file a motion to dismiss in the first three days because that's what you're supposed to do if you're representing me. You let the judge dismiss it. You file another motion for you know, unconstitutional laws mm -hmm. because that's what you're supposed to do. And then you take this to trial and see, I'm not cooperating. They have to find me guilty mm -hmm. and they don't do that. And I said, well, why aren't the lawyers doing this? And I said, well, the longer the case stays open, the more money they make. Yeah. And you're going, to, you're going to court month after month after month so I sat here and said, if every and especially lawyer did what if we they did, figure out you have money, right? Exactly. Yeah. But 
they should do what we did with the Manders case. It's like, no, we're not cooperating. We're going to trial. And if you prove it, then we can talk. But other than otherwise, no. Yeah. No. And that's what should happen across the board, and it's not. Okay. Well, it's going to start happening more. Amanda, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Congratulations. I had a friend go down and uh, film the press conference, and I was editing it and getting it prepared to put on YouTube and everything, and it was, uh, it's what I call sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Uh, and so I rejoice and you got your child back, but hmm, I knew this was going to happen. Um, I know the pain and, and have been through it. And it's so wrong. And I had to do this right away so I can get through it and move on with your story. <laughs> but, um, it's, I, I'm just so excited uh, because the, eventually the, the truth came out and the judge's hand was forced. So anyway, thanks for coming on. I'm so glad you have your child back and want, you know, want to give you a chance to tell your story and what took place and, and uh, uh, that we're here, <laughs> you know. So how did this all start, you know? Um, well, it started, uh, four months ago or so, and, um, where, uh, the, I guess, I now know they pinged my cell phone, um, to find me and my child at my sister's home. So, um, that's actually where, uh, two officers showed up and right off the bat started accusing me of basically being a child abuser. Um, and that's the first time you knew anything was going on? I, I had missed um, some calls and I, I had, you know, had this gut feeling, but I hadn't really known what was going on until the officers showed up at my door. Um, I had multiple calls from the uh, nurse, Voida, who has been a primary care provider for my children, all uh -huh. three of them for six years. She. Uh, I had a disagreement with her and fired her as my primary care provider. Okay. And she had called multiple times, which was weird because she was no longer a nurse that I used for my children. And so I didn't know what was really going on until the officers showed up at my sister's house and they said, uh, well, we're here. And I said, why you're here? I said, well, we were told to take your child. And I said, why? And they said, well, we were told that your child is in a life-threatening situation and you refuse to give him medications. Wow. And then I said, what medications? They couldn't tell me. Oh, my goodness. Um, which is uh, weird because the story varies from social worker to the police and what the social worker said to what, you know, other people said. So everybody had a slightly different story, but it kind of was basically ne medical neglect. And um, so, so was there a social worker there when... Uh, the police came to take your kids? Um, no, long story short, they... So it was the, just the police going the police, off of orders? Yep. Saying, they didn't have... These kids. They actually didn't have any paperwork in hand when they first came, no oh. warrant, any, anything like that. They told my sister if she didn't um, let them in that they would kick down her door um, sure. because they were told that right. this was a child who was in a life-threatening situation. And so th they had threatened her, so she let them in. And then they had seen my child. They said, I said, can I leave? Do you have a warrant? Do you have paperwork? And they didn't. Um, they, they got a 72-hour hold form to me and then told me that a warrant wasn't necessary when a child is in a life-threatening situation or that's what they were told anyways. Okay, because of the 72-hour hold laws that, right. that are out there. So they right. basically they do psych holds and stuff like that for, for people. Right. And, uh, yeah. yeah, and so... Um, I, at first I told them I'm not talking to you without legal counsel, and then I thought I Which, could fix the wh problem. Why did you come up with that? I mean, most people don't know that, and most people just start talking, but that's actually the right thing to do, but why, why did you do that? Um, why did you? Because I, I mean, that's always what I've been told. Okay. If, the, if the police right. show up and there's, you know, whether you did something right or wrong, and it's some serious accusation like child abuse, like me letting my 
basically what they were saying, letting my son die and not giving me medication. Um, if they're accusing me of something that serious, I'm like, okay, I probably need a lawyer right, before yeah. I speak to anybody. Right, right. And so I, uh, but then I was like, they're not getting a, we were sitting there for a long time. My son is dying. You mm -hmm. think they would have called an ambulance if he was dying? <laughs> you think they would have called an ambulance? But we're sitting there, he's playing on the floor. I asked the officers, does he look like he's um, in a life-threatening situation? They're like, no, but we're not a medical professional. And then when they said that, I thought I had to fix it all. And I'm like, okay, well, let's go to the ER. And I'll prove to you he's not in a life-threatening situation. So we go, um, they told me they were taking me to the ER. They, um, I refused to let them take my son without me. And they said, okay, well, you can get in the back of the squad car with your son, which we did. Okay. And all of a sudden, uh, we show, instead of going to the ER, we show up at uh, the clinic. Not an ER where life-threatening situations are treated, but at a clinic. And that clinic, the doctor that they took, the doctor or the nurse that they took my son to was the one I had previously fired uh. because we had disagreements on vaccinations. And she um, didn't like the fact that I said, you know, yes, I followed your recommendations for fully vaccinating my two older children, but I wanted to delay vaccinations with my youngest, Xavion, um, because of his, you know, issues, his medical issues and stuff, and the, some of the research I had done. Mm -hmm. And she had told me that um, something to the extent of I didn't care about my son or I didn't love my son if I didn't vaccinate him on her schedule. And I told her, I'm not against vaccinations. I just want to delay them. Right. And so um, that happened uh, when, I, when I got to the clinic. I was greeted uh, had two officers standing behind me. My son was in my arms. I was greeted by Katie Knettel. Um, she was visibly upset. And she's a social worker? She was a social worker that was on... For the county? Okay. Yes, she was a social what worker. What county was this? Morrison County Morrison. out of Little Falls, Minnesota. Okay. So she was a social worker from Morrison County, and she said, I'm taking your son inside. You can't come inside. And I said, you're not taking my son. This is my son. You're not taking my son. And then, and at one and point, she had no papers either at that time. No, I had received a photocopy of the seventy-two hour hold form okay. before we left to go to the emergency room, which is we didn't ever end up going to. We end up going to the clinic. Right. So I had received a photocopy of a copy of the seventy-two hour hold form. So when she and I, you know, she was arguing with me, and I said, "You're not taking my son in there without me. You're accusing me of something, and I'm going in there. I want to know what's going on. I have that right." He's not in your custody yet. I have the right to go in there. And um, she, at one point, lunged at me in front of the officer. She lunged at me to try to take, my, like this, to try to take my son out of my arms. And I, and I stepped back and I said, I don't care, you know, that the officers are here. I don't care that you're here, but you are not going to snatch my son out of my arms. And long story short, she reluctantly, I got to go inside to the appointment. Um, I videotaped everything, and uh, she did not like the fact that I was videotaping. That, that's another thing that people need to do that just doesn't happen very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Vi videotape everything. If you don't have a lawyer present with you and you're dealing with CPS, videotape everything because if you don't, they will come back and call you a liar. Right. And every time, right. I either didn't have a lawyer present or I wasn't videotaping, they called me a liar and I couldn't right. prove it. And I've had shows with other people on right. that if it wasn't for the videotape in the courthouse of things happening, that the, the police were already and the sheriffs were all ready to, to lie. But here's the most egregious part that happened during that very first visit. They had brought a foster care mom with them to take the child and they told a man that they were gonna take her child before they even did an examination, they said, we don't care what's going on. We're taking your child. Here's the foster With that, care. Without an examination. No examination. They had already determined they were taking her child. So there's other staff at this hospital or at this clinic, right? Or was it just this nurse? It was just, um, I think another nurse had come in just to do vitals, and then it was nurse Cassandra Voida um, from Center Care Health Plaza in St. Cloud. So it was in her office, and of course she, That's, I knew I was in trouble the minute they took, instead of taking my son to the ER that, for an alleged right. life-threatening event, 
they took him to the, the same nurse, the same primary care provider that I had had a disagreement with over yeah. vaccinations. And the, so, ER, the ER would have been better because it, you have, of course. The, it would have been a lot better. A lot more doctors, people right. around that have a better idea what's going on. No, I can't say better. But they took him but, to the ER that same night. After they took the him appointment. to the ER after, okay. after that first initial meeting. Right. He was on overnight observations. The social worker, Katie Canetto, got the report that said the baby was fine. He was 100% healthy. There was nothing wrong with the child. So she should have immediately taken that child and given it back to Amanda and said, okay, we know that what Dr. Uh, uh, Nurse Voida said is incorrect. He's not in a life-threatening situation. So it's not, you know, exigent circumstances. So right away, the emergency room said no life threat. After a 24-hour observation, it wasn't like they just did like a clearing. They kept the child for overnight observation, and the next day said, "He's fine. Great. Nothing's wrong with him. Let uh -huh. him go." Wow. And so the very next day, they knew this, and that came out at trial, and that's one of and the. And that's the first time it came out. No, no. Oh. It came out before they filed the petition. Amanda filed. Well, so you knew about it before, okay. Right, all right. So and we you just had to live with that knowledge and couldn't do anything about it in the no. meantime. No, I was innocent and I tried to, after they took my son, um, wasn't allowed to go to the ER where they had taken him after the appointment with uh, Miss Voida. Um, and I wasn't allowed, so I had to call in and pretend I was somebody else to get information on my son. And I said, is he in a life-threatening event? No. Is he okay? N yes. Is his apnea, sleep apnea still a problem? No. These are all things that I called in. Mm -hmm. But as soon as they found out that I was his mother, um, they must have had a note or something um, to say that they couldn't speak with me about my son. Wow. Um, so um, otherwise, I don't know why, if they were so concerned about me being his mother, why they wouldn't let me have information on my son. And in fact, the foster mom, after they took my son and left him in 24-hour 24 ob 24 observation overnight, uh, the, the foster parent and the social worker left him. He was only, the nurse came in, I'm sure a nurse on duty went in and checked on him, but he was left as a 10-month-old infant by himself the first night ever in his life away from his mother. He was left by himself. No, nobody was there the whole time. Nobody was there the whole time to support him like yeah. I would have been. Right. If they would have let me be there for my son, yeah. then he, would have, he yeah. would have had somebody there. Yeah. Yeah, it's, so they're all concerned about child neglect, and yet they don't mind neglecting the child themselves. It's, it's, just, baff this, it's just baffling. In my case, they clearly, my, my son is, has problems. He has anxiety. He's only, I think, 14 months old As a old result now. of this. As a result of this, yeah. he has separation anxiety that is more extreme than any child. I, um, in fact, can hear him out in the hallway right now because he, he just, you know, he wants his mom all the time. He has hard times falling yeah. asleep. It's above and beyond what a normal 14-month-old mm -hmm. uh, infant uh, would throw fits. This is, right. this is extreme. Okay. Well, we got, about four, we got about four minutes left in the show, so... Mm -hmm. Gonna manage your time. We've got a lot more to discuss. You want to bring Xavion in so everyone yeah. can see the, the, yeah. the rescue yeah. we did. Xavion, come Zavian. on in. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's you know this was this was a win for everyone. This case showed everyone what social services does and how they you know take this, children and keep them for. You know, months and months He's on walking end. over here, 14 months, big smile, <laughs> just sees mama. She missed his first steps. That's, yeah. you know, during, during the time yeah. he was... Uh, yep, I missed yeah. his first steps. I missed three of his teeth. I only got to see him for an hour on his first birthday. Second, Amanda, you're on the court. Oh. oh. Okay. Okay. Go. So they let you see him on his birthday. Yeah, I, I, how, I how had nice to... I had hour. to basically beg for them to make time... And they made an hour for me on his first birthday to see him. Otherwise, I would not have got to see him at all on his first birthday. Huh. So if this is all about shots, why didn't they just give shots and then give the child back? Um, because right. it wasn't, because the, the original reason why they took him away wasn't over vaccination. Okay. The original reason why they took him away was I took him into an emergency room for a cough, um, had been discharged. The Children's Hospital in Minneapolis had called 
Cassandra Voida, mm -hmm. and um, Cassandra Voida made the call. Not the hospital I took him to, but Cassandra Voida mm -hmm. had made the call. Mm -hmm. and, and it started because, you know, Amanda, after waiting for hours to be discharged, she had had a discharge physical and yeah. she was waiting for them to sign out. She's just like, is there anything else that needs to be done? They were like, no, is there anything we need to do? She says, no. So she said, well, I, I want to go home. Uh -huh. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm here with my three-year-old. You know, we've been awake all night. You know, my son's been awake. Yeah, you know. it makes a lot of noise. Just <laughs> you know, <laughs> so, on the table. you know, yeah. uh, and so she, she ended up signing a release, and they let her go. Yeah. Well, we've got uh, two minutes left, but the okay. judge said something about this case that just kind of flabbergasted me. Uh, and I forget what the issue was, but... I know Eric Cardle had mentioned it, uh, where, you know, he had to give the child back. Yes. But he wouldn't, um, it's not that he wouldn't <gasps> act on the social workers. Uh, I can't remember what he said. He, they Do you kept, remember what They his? kept the child for an additional week right. because Amanda failed to cooperate with them in providing her address. Fuck. And so they said that the child was in need of protection or services because they hadn't looked at the mother's residence uh -huh. to see if it was safe for the child. But we're like, well, that's not what this is all about. Huh. You know, so what they ended up doing was making something up because, you know, when I say making it up, I'm like, this was all about medical neglect. This is, now, because we've proven that there was no medical neglect, he says, well, we're still going to keep the child until we get to see your residence. We're mm -hmm. like, well, what does that have to do with it? He's, he's, we, we won the trial, and yeah. now you're going to hold the child for a little bit longer. Yeah. So, All right. That's what Eric was speaking about. Yeah. Well, you know, we're out of time, but uh, it goes by fast. Thanks for yeah. coming on. Thanks and, for having us. Uh, more to come. There will be more reports. So, folks, remember, if... Uh, you don't stand up for other people's liberties. Who's going to stand up for yours? And good men don't do nothing. So help and help with the fundraiser. Yes, we, we need family, them. We'd like to hire more attorneys. Family Preservation Foundation. Yeah, more attorneys. I'm sure some would like to join. All right, God bless. Have a good week.